fresh meat. Screenwriter Ian A. Stewart and executive producer John F. Bassett have both described their 1981 horror film The Pit as B-grade garbage. But if this is a movie that its own filmmakers would throw into the garbage heap, it's also one that many horror fans have happily dug up over the years and proclaimed to be a hidden treasure. We don't consider this deeply strange, often appropriate, oddly unnerving movie to be garbage. We count The Pit as worthy of being featured here on the best horror movie you never saw. While Ian A. Stewart would go on to be involved in the production of more than 100 films and television programs that aren't listed on his IMDb page, The Pit earned him his sole writing credit for a narrative feature, making it all the more disappointing he wasn't happy with the outcome. Stewart's issue with the film really stemmed from the producer's decision to hire Lou Lehman to direct, as it seems nearly every choice Lehman made during the production was the exact opposite of the choice the writer would have made. The Pit was the first and only film Lehman ever directed, but he had a lot of experience working in theater, so giving him the chance to make a movie was a sensible idea. He had even been the first managing director at the Charles Playhouse in his hometown of Boston before he moved to Canada to work on film and television, primarily in the music department, but also as a producer. The fact that he was American may have also played into the decision to hire him for The Pit because while the movie was a Canadian production, it was actually filmed in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, a location Bassett had fallen for when his daughter Carling, a future professional tennis player, attended tennis camp there. Lehman had also just earned some horror cred as he was one of the writers on the 1980 horror film Phobia, directed by legendary John Huston. Phobia hadn't turned out very well, but it gave Lehman genre experience nonetheless. The choices that didn't sit well with Stewart began with the hiring of Sammy Snyders to play the lead role of Jamie Benjamin, a very disturbed young boy the writer had envisioned as being eight or nine years old. Snyder was in his early teens when he was cast, and while he was meant to be playing slightly younger than his actual age, Stewart felt that the age difference was enough to throw the whole story off track. While Jamie had been written to have an interest in the women around him, the scenes dealing with his interests were meant to come off as more innocent and mischievous. Due to Snyder's age, Jamie does come off as being quite the creepy little pervert in the film, even if he's not aware of just how much of a creep he's being. His level of maturity is lagging behind his outward appearance, which was not Stewart's attention in the script. Jamie has a crush on his live-in babysitter Sandy, played by Jeannie Elias, and sneaks into the bathroom while she showers. But she bathes him in one scene, so he might not think it's such a big deal that he's in the room with her while she bathes as well. Jamie also mentions that his mother bathes him with questionable frequency, an implication of molestation that Lehman added. Jamie's creepiness goes even further with the local librarian Laura Hollingsworth as Margaret Livingstone. Not only does he paste her face on a picture he cut out of a nude photography book, but there's also a really crazy sequence in which Jamie calls the woman on the phone, claims to have kidnapped her young niece, and says he'll only let the girl go if Margaret strips in front of her window so he can see her from the outside. Jamie takes Polaroid pictures as he watches pictures he'll be looking at a lot. But The Pit isn't just a story of an adolescent pervert. Jamie also has very weird interactions with his teddy bear. The bear speaks to him, it's his advisor and confidant, and usually a talking teddy bear would be the strangest thing in a horror movie, but here the bear is just one strange ingredient in a whole stew of weird. Teddy had been on the title of Stewart's script, but the film is called The Pit because of the large hole Jamie finds out in the woods containing furry little flesh-eating creatures that he figures are troglodytes or as he calls them, trellalogs, a mispronunciation that Stuart hated because he had written it to be troglodytes. He thought trellalogs sounded ridiculous, and it does, but that's the part of the pit's charm. It's ridiculous and weird with a lot of messed up stuff going on in it. Jamie takes on the job of caring for these trellalogs who are stuck at the bottom of the pit and makes sure to keep them fed. At first, he steals money so he can buy meat to feed them, but when that's no longer an option, he decides to start feeding people to these voracious little creatures. People 
who have wronged him, like the school bully, an old lady who is rude to him because she thinks he'll grow up to be a hippie, Margaret Livingstone's hateful niece Abigail, yes, the girl's name is Abigail, with an R in there, it's not just another one of Jamie's mispronunciations, and a guy he sees as a rival for Sandy's affection. Now, Jamie's killing people. But it's for a good cause. A trollologues gotta eat. Stewart was inspired to write the Teddy script after having conversations with two of his friends. One was a ventriloquist who would use his dummy to communicate with troubled children, and Stewart was struck by the idea that the children would ignore the ventriloquist's presence to focus only on the dummy that was interacting with them. The more direct and obvious inspiration came from his child psychiatrist friend, who told him about a patient who drew pictures of creatures that he felt he was in control of. The kid would imagine these creatures devouring the people he didn't like, and once that happened, he would no longer acknowledge the person's existence. And that's how we get the trollologues in the film. But the troglodytes in Stuart's script did not really exist, just like the creatures drawn by the psychiatrist's patient didn't exist. The psychiatrist told Stuart, in a quote, I've had to sign commitment orders for children who are 8, 9, and 10 years old who are not really children. They're little balls of hate and fury. And the only reason they haven't killed somebody yet is that they're not big enough and strong enough. But someday, unless you deal with that problem, you have the next murderer, next rapist. That child who's full of hate and fury is going to react violently against the world. Stewart wanted to tell the story of such a child, and he wanted the film to be a serious and realistic examination of his mental condition. Everything involving Jamie feeding people to the creatures in the woods was meant to be happening entirely in his mind. There was supposed to be a twist ending where the viewer would see that everyone the Trogs had eaten were still alive, but Lehman didn't shoot that twist ending. He took the straightforward creature feature approach, so in the pit, Jamie is a troubled kid and the Trogs also exist. The interactions with the teddy bear may still be entirely in Jamie's mind, although Lehman shot the bear in a way that also might make you wonder if it's actually possessed by some kind of entity. If you want to see how Stewart meant for the story to play out, a novelization of his screenplay was written by John Galt and published with the original Teddy title. If you can get your hands on that book, apparently it tells the story in a dark and serious way that Stewart intended. The screenwriter was not consulted about any of the decisions made after Lehman signed on, but he wasn't kept away from the production completely. He did have to come in and shoot some of the scenes for Lehman because the director's wife wouldn't let him shoot any of the moments involving actresses who were nude or scantily clad, except one. Lehman cast his own 18-year-old daughter Jennifer as a skinny dipper who appears late in the film, so he was present for the moment when she flashes her breasts. Jennifer Lehman would work on several more productions in the future, but as a business manager and accountant, skinny dipping in the pit remains her only on-screen acting role. Despite some involved having negative opinions about the finished product, The Pit seems to have been an enjoyable production to work on, especially for Beaver Dam residents who were hired to be part of the crew and those who were paid $4 an hour to be extras in the film. For example, the crew member responsible for hairstyle continuity was local Beaver Dam salon owner. While she was appalled by the nudity and violence when she saw the movie, she had such a blast working on it for the six weeks of principal photography that she briefly considered moving to Canada to work as a hairdresser on more film productions. Her husband helped art director Pete Stone build the pit, which was a 15-foot deep hole that was dug on a Beaver Dam property, lined with aluminum screening, sprayed with foam insulation, painted black, and then dressed with roots and twigs. The bottom of the pit was covered with hundreds of boxes so the actors who fell into the pit would have a soft landing. It sounds like Sammy Snyder's had fun in Beaver Dam as he would go out dancing at a local disco bar during his free time. He actually started off as a dancer before he got into acting and retired from acting soon after the pit so he could continue pursuing a career as a dancer. He's a dancing instructor in Toronto now, teaching moves to classes full of people who, for the most part, have probably never seen his performance as Jamie Benjamin. The filming of The Pit wasn't all good times and dance breaks. They did hit some bumps along the way. Jeannie Elias was cast in the midst of production because Lehman felt the actress who was originally cast as the babysitter didn't have the right chemistry with Snyder's. And that wasn't the only recasting situation. According to Elias, the director had originally wanted the Trogs to be played by children. But once the kids were put in the Trog costumes and put to work in the heat of the summer of 1979, they ended up getting sick. 
so the decision was made to replace them with little people. The Trog costumes were redesigned along the way because Lehman wasn't happy with the way they looked, and the shots of the Trogs inside the pit were reshoots conducted on a stage in Toronto. The look of the Trogs is yet another thing that Stewart doesn't like about the movie, so the redesign and reshoots really didn't do any good as far as he's concerned. According to actor Richard Alden, who plays Jamie's father in the film, the pit ran into more serious issues in post-production, as Lehman's plan to take the same approach to his film as John Huston took to Phobia didn't go as expected. Alden said, and I quote, Houston cut his films in his head. Lou tried to do that, and it didn't work quite so well, I think, because he had trouble putting it together. The pit seemed to have cut together just fine in the end, although it starts off with a jarring flash forward as the first sequence in the movie shows Jamie knocking a bully into the pit on Halloween night, a sequence that we'll see all over again nearly one hour later. Lehman and editor Rick Morden obviously thought they should get the movie started off with a kill, so they just lifted one from later in the movie and dropped it at the front in a rather clunky and awkward way. This causes some confusion early on, since it takes a while to understand that Jamie isn't already feeding people to the Trogs when the story begins. We've just seen a glimpse into the future. So that's what you mean. There's not much information available on how well The Pit performed when it was released in 1981. All you'll find on Box Office Mojo is that it made $560 in the US, which doesn't bode well for the rest of its take. Regardless of whether or not it made its budget back from theatrical play, it definitely started building a cult following as soon as people started renting it from video stores, unaware of the insanity they'd be witnessing once they hit play on their VCR. The Pit has earned such a notable following over the years that Kino Lorber released a special edition Blu-ray in 2016. If a director had shot Stewart's screenplay in exactly the way the writer wanted his story to be presented, maybe it would have resulted in an awesome, disturbing, realistic horror movie. According to Stewart, Bassett had another child psychiatrist read the screenplay before filming began, and the doctor said the script was the best depiction he had ever read of the mind of a psychotic child. There is definitely merit in something like that, but it's tough to imagine that sort of movie would have had to nearly amount the entertainment value The Pit has. Stewart wanted his movie to have sensitivity, subtlety, and class. But The Pit is better without it. Much of what makes this a great movie to watch are the decisions Lehman made and Stewart disagreed with. The fact that the Trogs are real makes the movie much more fun than it would have been if Jamie was just imagining them, and the casting of Sammy Snyder's really makes the movie what it is. Snyder's, who has said he was oblivious to some of the more inappropriate aspects of the story, did a terrific job playing his very unusual character. He sells the oddness of Jamie perfectly. Sometimes his bad behavior is amusing, and sometimes it's effectively troubling. But while Jamie is occasionally creepy and needs someone to teach him that many of the things he does are very wrong, Snyder's is also able to make him an endearing character. We certainly like him better than some of the jerks he ends up feeding to the Trogs, and many viewers will probably be rooting for him to get out of this crazy situation without losing his life to the creatures he's taking care of. In the end, it may have been the film's greatest benefit that the director and screenwriter had opposite opinions on what was happening in the story, because dueling viewpoints help the film achieve its strange tone, where some of the things that should only be occurring in the mind of an unbalanced young boy are somehow now real. The film was also given a nice boost by the music composed by Victor Davies, who took the salary he was paid and used it to hire more musicians to give the score a bigger, more Hollywood sound. It was worth the price he paid because he and his collaborators turned in a great horror movie score. Many of the best scenes in the pit involve Jamie tricking people into taking a tumble into the Trog's pit, which is made even better by the preceding scene in which he tries to get a cow to follow him to the pit. Realizing it's going to be impossible to feed this cow to the Trog's, Jamie tells it, I didn't want to hurt you anyways. And then he moves on to the backup plan of feeding humans to the Trog's, which is much less unsettling to him than the idea of dropping animals into the hole innocent animals don't deserve the fate of being torn apart by the trollologs, but the nasty people he knows do. The creature feature action reaches a new level toward the end of the film, when the trogs escape from the pit and start rampaging through the beaver dam countryside attacking people like Lehman's skinny dipping daughter, and it all builds up to the perfect ending. 
Stewart has said that executive producer John F. Bassett apologized to him for what they did to his screenplay. Sadly, Bassett passed away in 1986, which it leaves us to wonder if he would still be apologizing for The Pit if he could see the fact that it's enduring as a cult favorite 40 years later. This movie is nothing to apologize for. It's something to be celebrated because it's such an awesomely weird piece of entertainment, a film that seems to take glee in the strange characters, sights, and scenarios it presents to the viewer. The Pit is so much fun to watch, it's a shame that Lou Lehman never directed another movie, as we probably could have gotten some more great flicks out of him if he had. But at least we got the pit, so thank you to Bassett and to the producer Bennett Fode for picking Lehman to direct the project. They made the right choice. And thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horrors video channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all your support.